morning. Uh, well, yesterday uh, I was talking, I tried to point out the significance of Rizzo's philosophy uh, in the contemporary global uh, thinking, especially the development, for the development of the axiological framework of the new uh, contemporary global ethics. So in this lecture, uh, I will try to expose his significance in another context, namely in the context of modern Sinophone philosophy, because uh, the embeddedness of his philosophy into this context can also reveal uh, to us some special characteristics uh, of his philosophy and uh, that, will, that could otherwise maybe remain hidden or were not um, so easy, would be not so easy to understand. So, and uh, if we are talking about the sign of own philosophy of the second part of the 20th century, in which Lidze Hopp has also created uh, his uh, most important works, uh, then uh, we cannot overlook the philosophical current of the so-called modern Confucianism. Why modern? Why I call them modern Confucianism? I will tell you a bit later. For now, it is a secret. So, um, what do their theories actually uh, and approaches have in common, and where are the differences? So we will first introduce uh, these both discourses. Of course, uh, I don't think I have to introduce uh, Lidze Hall especially, because you probably read about him in the uh, study literature you were supposed to read, uh, so you know him and his work. But um, uh, I will start with a short introduction of the modern Confucian stream of thought because maybe most of you are not so familiar with these uh, philosophers. So modern Confucianism uh, actually in Chinese this uh, stream of thought is called Xin Ru Xue which means new Confucianism. But I still prefer to call them modern Confucianism and that is for two reasons mainly. First of all, hi Paul. <laughs> First of all, um, now I'm really distracted. <laughs> okay. So the first reason is because um, it's um, many scholars who are, especially those who are not very familiar with the Chinese ideation of history, they um, call this stream neo Confucianism, which is also it is this, which is also the same like neo Confucianism. So it is a correct translation of Xin Ru Xue. But with this, they that they create a confusion with the neo Confucianism of the Song and Ming dynasties. You will see them later in my lecture that. Um, this was this stream of thought, uh, the second or third phase of Confucianism, was uh, denoted Neo-Confucianism by the first translators. So if scholars now uh, talk about Xin Ru Xie as Neo-Confucianism, they create this confusion with, uh, which, which is not necessary. This is the first reason why I prefer to denote them uh, with the term modern Confucianism. And the second uh, reason is because they were dealing mostly with um, modernization, with the process of Chinese modernization, as we have uh, been hearing um, yesterday a lot about it from Lidze Hall's standpoint also. So, uh, but let's uh, introduce them uh, shortly. Oh. So, uh, they, their main agenda was actually they wanted to revitalize uh, traditional thought by means of new influences borrowed or derived from Western uh, systems of thought. So, they were, uh, they wanted to revitalize, uh -huh, sorry. 
they wanted to revitalize this philosophy from the... I'm so sorry. Something happened. Um, but I will just um, go on. Otherwise we will lose too much time. Yeah, uh, so they wanted to revitalize uh, traditional Chinese uh, thought by means of... Um, uh, but through a dialogue with Western philosophy. And they wanted to find a synthesis uh, between Western and traditional Chinese thought in order to elaborate a new system of ideas and values that would be suitable for the modern globalized uh, philosophy. So they, their philosophies were based on the supposition that Confucian thought could be amalgamated with capitalistic development. Um, they were also based on the belief that the renewed form of this um, traditional Chinese system of philosophical and moral thought could serve as a thank you. Jan, you are great. Thank you. Yeah, please. No problem. Uh, now I have to be more careful somehow. Um, that they hope that they will revitalize this thought in a sense that it could serve them as a basis for endowing modern life with ethical meaning and uh, that it would serve as a kind of spiritual salvation for the alienation which appeared as an as a undesirable side effect of the modernization. And uh, they are, of course, uh, modern um, ideation and history uh, usually distinguish or divides them into three generations. This is also in accordance with uh, traditional Confucian, uh, Confucian genealogy. So the first generation were the philosophers that were working and um, living also uh, at this, uh, in the second part of the 20th century, uh, in the first part of the 20th century. Most important of them was uh, Xiong Shili in this context, but also Fang Yulang, maybe some of you know him, uh, Liang Shuming, Zhang Jinmai and He Lin. Then the second generation, I will introduce this second generation more in detail uh, a bit later because we will be focusing on this generation in our comparison between Li Zihou and the modern Confucian current of thought. Uh, and the third generation, good morning, and the third generation is the generation uh, of Zheng Zhuming, Liu Shuxian, Wu Weiming, and Yu Yingshi. Two of them have sadly passed away recently, Yu Yingshi and Liu Shuxian. But Zheng Zhuming and Wu Weiming are still alive, and very much so they are still very active. Uh, well, and most of the three of these four uh, members of the of the third generation uh, all lived in the USA, uh, except for Liu Shuxian, who lived and worked in Taiwan in the Academia Sinica. So maybe we could also mention here the Confucian revival in mainland China, in contemporary China, uh, which um, followed the period of gradual liberalization. So they, these philosophers have also focused on the question of revitalizing uh, traditional philosophy, but also at the same time they were developing new approaches for their for the modernized integration uh, into contemporary Chinese society. And these scholars are uh, most well known are Chen Dai and also Guo Jiyong. Uh, and Tang Yijie, who is the only one who already passed away recently, and then Zheng Jiaodong, Zhang Lilan, Meng Dei Yuan, and Mo Zhongjian. Okay, but now let's focus on the second generation. Because, as I said, we will be comparing these two uh, discourses. 
um, because they were created at approximately the same time. Uh, and <coughs> um, they were also, this was the generation that also to a certain extent has influenced uh, Lidze Holstor. So this, um, this generation comprises four um, philosophers. Uh, Mo Tung San is uh, thought as the most important of them, or the most well-known, because he has created some new uh, independent theories. Um, Tang Jingyi is also, is maybe the second most important, he also <coughs> was a quite a creative uh, philosopher, although very conservative, especially concerning the role of women. So, I wasn't doing adios playing research on Tang uh, Jingyi. Okay, then Fang Dongmei. Fang Dongmei is not counted into this uh, among the modern Confucians normally. Uh, because uh, he himself said that he is not only Confucian but also Taoist and Buddhist philosopher. But I think that if we take modern Confucianism in a more broader sense, as we will see later, uh, it also comprises many elements of Buddhist and um, Taoist uh, philosophies. And the last one, last but not least, Xu Fu Guan. Uh, he was not actually a philosopher, uh, but more uh, an expert in uh, Chinese ideational uh, history, intellectual history. But he is also very famous for creating uh, one of the first systematic uh, histories of Chinese uh, aesthetics, of traditional Chinese aesthetics. Now let's, uh, and although of course, there were four philosophers, one of our comparandas, the object uh, which we compared, consists of four philosophers and the other one um, only of one philosopher. But this is because these four uh, philosophers of the second generation worked together very tightly. They were in continuous uh, mutual exchange and they proceeded from more or less the same paradigms. That's why they form, a, we can say that they form a unique discourse. And uh, Lietzenhoff's philosophy is uh, also unique because uh, I don't know any other contemporary Chinese philosopher who would create similar paradigms that, we, that can be found in this world. So they had some biographical similarities if we, uh, if we try to proceed from the similarities between them. They were, they, they all had a similar fate, they all were creating their most major uh, works in exile. So the members of the second generation of modern Confucianism were forced to, no, they were not forced, uh, they fled from uh, mainland China in 1949 uh, from, because they were afraid from the Communist Party. Uh, and Li Zihou uh, was also born and raised in China and uh, was working in Peking. And then after the Tiananmen incident uh, in which he was to a certain extent involved, he uh, also he was more or less really um, forced to, uh, to move to the USA where he remained the last 30 years of his life. So there is a biographical connection and their mutual relation is uh, like that. The members of the modern Confucian stream of thought did not know much about Li Zihou, or maybe they did, didn't want to know much. First of all, he was about two decades younger and for a normal Confucian scholar it is not uh, suitable to exchange ideas with younger listeners. That was one reason. And the second reason is because they didn't want to deal with uh, mainland uh, China philosophy because they thought that it was solely a product of communist ideologies, which was of course not true. This is very exaggerated, but okay, this neo these neoconservative thinkers uh, had such uh, an ideology. 
And, but Lederhoff's philosophy was clearly influenced, it is, uh, it is obvious from his works that, uh, it, that his philosophy was clearly influenced by the modern Confucian approaches, uh, but he, he was also very, very critical to their ideas. So he even said that uh, while he can accept or he can um, um, embrace the idea that uh, he is a Confucian scholar, he could never accept modern Confucianism because this stream of thought is a follower of the Sung Dynasty, Neo-Confucianism, and this was a discourse he really disliked, and we will see uh, why in the continuation of this lecture. So, uh, but on the other side, he also acknowledged that um, that they had uh, that they had a very positive role to play in the second part of the 20th century because um, they were the only one ones who really uh, took care for the continuation of the research in the Confucian tradition and I cannot but agree with this. Um, with this um, idea. So this model, the second generation, I forgot to tell you that for those who don't know. The second generation of modern Confucianism has fled to Taiwan after 49. So they were all representatives of what we call modern Taiwanese philosophy. And this philosophy really immensely contributed to the continuity of research uh, in the Chinese intellectual tradition. In fact, they played a role of uh, a life bed uh, for, the, uh, for the maintaining of the research in the Chinese intellectual tradition, especially be between uh, 1949 and maybe the late 80s. Um, because most of the mainland Chinese philosophers were dealing at that time with the most topical question, the question of the Sinization of Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, which was, of course, also very good, because after all, Karl Marx is one of the greatest theory and most influential theorists of modern uh, Europe and pre-modern Europe. But, um, on the other hand, and also in this sense, you know, this extensive um, dealing with Marxism has the effect that the Chinese uh, intellectuals could understand modern European uh, thought in a better way. But on the other hand, and very regretfully, they have neglected in this period, also due to ideological pressures partly, they have neglected um, the research in uh, their own tradition. And this is why this research was carried out and uh, somehow um, developed in a systematic way only in Taiwan. So, but then we also have to state that while modern Confucian's thought was marked by an openness to the tradition and by an unbroken uh, continuity of research in this tradition, uh, on this tradition, Li Zhehou on mainland China was uh, one of the first, if not the first philosopher who openly uh, acknowledged the importance of Confucian philosophy for uh, Chinese cultural identity. So he brought to life what we could call the, rec the ideational rehabilitation of uh, Confucianism in uh, the People's Republic of China, because after the 80s, Confucius became important again in mainland China. Okay, so um, this let's let's look again to the common roots of uh, 
both these discourses under observation, they were, were both searching, as we have seen, for a synthesis between uh, Western and traditional, and traditional Chinese thought, and they both strove to elaborate some ideas and values that would be capable of resolving the social and political problems of the modern uh, globalized world. They were seeking both for a possible revival of traditional Chinese uh, concepts and categories. They wanted to find similar, uh, some concepts that are similar or can be related to those concepts in the Chinese, um, to, uh, in the European, uh, modern European uh, philosophy, which served as the basis, the ideational basis of modernization. So when they tried to find what they did, they tried to find similar concepts in their own, in the Chinese tradition, and to modernize them in order that they could serve as a um, intellectual, ideational basis for the Chinese type of uh, modernization. Okay, so the common starting point was the modernization of tradition. So, and we could also call that, of course, uh, where is Fabian? Fabian mentioned yesterday that every day. No, no, uh, the other one who is not here. Somebody uh, mentioned yesterday that in China everything has to be with the Chinese characteristics, not only socialism, but uh, everything. Oh, yeah, you said that. What's your name? I'm Peter. Yeah, I'm more or less. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so they were dealing with um, uh, modernization with Chinese characteristics. So, and they they all were aiming to create a theoretical model, uh, a model of modernization that could not be confused or even equated with um, westernization. So, but this is the common approach, uh, this is the common basis, the common roots, but their approaches were quite different as we will see now. So, um, First, I would, I would begin with uh, approaches of the uh, modern Confucian stream of thought. Uh, <clears throat> although they believed that the European colonial past had to a great extent influenced these processes, they still uh, didn't believe that uh, Chinese modernization should be equated with uh, westernization. They didn't see modernization as a universal process, but rather as one that was culturally conditioned, at least partly. So their main aim was to preserve Chinese, what we call cultural identity, a very controversial uh, term, of course, but they didn't have any problems with it, so uh, they were striving to preserve the Chinese cultural identity in the modern world. world. So uh, they were focusing, uh, I just mentioned that they tried to find some concepts that would be similar to crucial concept, uh, Western concepts of uh, which underlie modernization. So they were focusing on the concepts of the subject, of autonomy, and of rationality. Three concepts that are really of crucial importance for the development of modernization. So, and um, regarding the subject, they tried to develop, they, they were proceeding from their own tradition and they tried to develop the uh, concept which unified in itself the uh, empirical and the transcendental subject, or in Chinese terminology, nation Y1, internal sage and uh, external ruler. And this, um, they, especially Mo Zhong San, believed that uh, in Chinese tradition, the, one of the reasons why 
China couldn't come to its own modernization was because this internal stage, the, the transcendental, the transcendent uh, subject, the moral subject was exaggerately uh, emphasized in the Chinese tradition. So the empirical subject or the external ruler, Wai Wang, could not really develop what, uh, what he should develop, namely uh, knowledge that was not bound to morality, but also exploration of the natural world, which could lead to the development of science and also uh, political philosophy, which could lead to a development of uh, democracy. So autonomy, regarding autonomy, they were trying to develop some proto-democratic and um, autonomous um, um, elements that could be found in the Mencian philosophy, or in the philosophy of Mangza, Mencius, uh, <coughs> who was also uh, writing about, uh, about uh, issues that could be related to the concept of free will or categorical imperative and they developed in this sense they developed uh, <coughs> no
But uh, this is the core thing I would like to add to uh, Professor Paul's brilliant uh, um, explanation that he, uh, these intellectuals were looking uh, to this um, opposition, T and Jung, essence and function, through the lens of dualisms. And the dualisms exclude each other and they are in mutual contradiction. And, um, but as Professor Paul has emphasized yesterday already, they cannot be separated in the sense that Lidze Ho used them. Lidze Ho has used them in a very traditional way, namely in the way um, of what I call binary categories, which function in a complementary fashion. So T and Jung in this system are a unity, like Professor Paul said, but they are not a fusion, uh, they are more, uh, they form a dynamic processual entity which is in uh, continuous uh, interaction with uh, one another. So, and they are also interdependent, which means that without T there could be no Jung and vice versa. So we have to distinguish here between dualisms, T and Jung in, uh, in this system were not used in the sense of a dualism, but in the sense of a binary category or duili fancho. <coughs> so, um, as we have seen yesterday, uh, for Lidze Ho, this was, the T was, no, no, for the modern Confucians, T was the essence of tradition, but for Lidze Ho, it was the material uh, basis of society. And he said, as you can see in this uh, quotation, for those of you who can read Chinese, he said that the biggest flaw of this slogan, uh, Chinese uh, essence, uh, Western function or application, is that it assumes that um, technology, as we have seen yesterday, is technology is uh, application, but actually the right thing, the right way to look at it is to look at um, technology as essence as the material basis uh, of society and not as applications. So, uh, yeah, I think that this thing I can really uh, skip because Professor Paul has already uh, talked really a lot about it, that uh, T was seen as a base and Jung as a superstructure, but the superstructure is also very important in this way. This is also where he differs from Marxism, because this superstructure is not only something secondary uh, or unimportant, because it implies everything which constitutes concrete human lives, like culture, rituals, art, political systems, intuitions, institutions, also intuitions, uh, gender roles, ideologies, and so on. So it is to a certain extent uh, in accordance with original Marxism, with the early art Marxism, with the marks of the political and economic manuscripts from 1844, not with later marks, and original uh, Confucians. So, and he tried, of course, to, uh, to illuminate this uh, this distinction with a more contemporary explanation where he used T and Jung as hardware and software and he said that even though the hardware of material life, refrigerators, air conditions, televisions and so on are in unlimited use throughout the world, this is the universal aspect of modernization, the software of human life economic organization, political systems, customs, behavior patterns, worldviews, and so on, differ with respect to diverse political and cultural traditions. So Jung 
this Jung, this application had an immense importance in, uh, in his system because without Jung, without the Chinese Jung, there would be no Chinese modernization. So he believes that uh, identifying with one's own tradition is a prerequisite for the development of any society or individual. So for him, as we can see, this kind of cultural identity was also of utmost uh, importance. So in the day have, um, if we now continue with, uh, with differences between these two discourses, modern confusion and literal, um, they, this, uh, these differences can be uh, pinned down uh, in three aspects. The first is the problem of ontology in relation to the issues of immanence and transcendence. The second one is the problem of the human self. And the third one is the problem of interpreting the history of Confucianism. So, or in other words, the historiography of Confucian uh, discourses. So, uh, regarding ontology, the modern Confucians have uh, modum san concrete has developed or established a concept of uh, the so-called immanent transcendence, Nei Zai Chao Yue, which is also for Western-trained philosophers, it is a kind of nonsense uh, or a contradiction in itself because anything can either be immanent or transcendent. These two realms are, uh, in this dualistic view, completely, uh, completely separated from each other. They can be no immanent transcendence. Nonsense. But I think that uh, in the processual uh, Chinese worldview, it is not. Uh, it is not actually nonsense. It makes sense. And maybe it would be better to translate this Nei Chao Yue with the term um, transcendence in immanent, because it is still a correct translation. And it would be easier for Western-trained philosophers to understand uh, what this is actually about. Uh, and because notion, the, the notion of transcendence in immanence is uh, already well known from some pantheistic systems, also from Spinoza's philosophy, for instance, and so on. But, um, however, I have they said, for instance, no, I don't have time to go into this, although I find it very. Huh? Oh, this is not. Okay, then I can go uh, into it a little bit. They tried to, to um, introduce or to explain this concept uh, through, the, through the notion of Tao, for instance. Because Tao is, has this double ontological nature. It is immanent, it is transcendent because it, because it continuously creates everything, but it is at the same time immanent because it is a part of every concrete uh, individual human path. It is also, also if we uh, try to compare, for instance, the idea of creator, it is in Western relig monotheistic religions, especially in Christianity, with which we are most familiar with, um, the creator, God, creates everything that exists. But he is separated from what he created. So, because he is transcendent. But the Tao, on the other hand, is also the creator. He, it is the ultimate principle that continuously creates everything that exists. But it is at the same time, it is at the same time part of uh, his creation. For instance, Lao Tzu said, Tao Tzu, or Bu Li, it creates, but it doesn't leave what it created or what she created. So, um, <clears throat> but so, so much about the um, about the um, um, immanent transcendent. And now, Li Zhou uh, has sharply criticized this notion, but not 
uh, nothing separate of, from proceeding from the same or, or having the same reasons uh, of the same reasons than uh, than Western trained philosophers, but for another reason. He said that it is uh, that Chinese philosophy is based on the one world view. There are no different spheres anyway. In that there are no different threads, and it is an unnecessary nonsense to bring into Chinese philosophy or to try to look at it through the lens of such Western categories as um, as um, um, immanent and translate uh, and uh, transcendent. So what he promoted regarding the ontology of uh, traditional Chinese philosophy is the notion of the one world, one world view. So uh, the problem of human self, I have already explained this in the beginning that the, uh, that the modern Confucianism has um, has tried to elaborate on this concept through the nation dialogue uh, concept, the concept of uh, inner sage and external ruler, and uh, the, the problem was that this uh, external ruler, the empirical subject, was suppressed in the Chinese traditional um, philosophy. So they tried. To uh, Mao Zong San tried to create a theory in which this mother, uh, this um, moral self, this uh, inner inner um, sage, would block himself for a certain amount of time, so the external ruler could come out and create uh, and establish uh, scientific thinking and democracy. So, and this uh, theory was called the self-negation of the inner sage. But Little Ho, on the other side, had a completely different picture, image of the human self, uh, proceeding from uh, human relations. He said that the human self in the Chinese, the traditional Chinese worldview, was constituted through uh, relations uh, he or she had with other fellow human beings and also with society uh, as such. And these relations, in these relations, he proceeded from the Confucian um, five basic paradigmatic relationships, and uh, in which the family was of utmost importance. So he said that for Chinese society, traditional society, the notion of feminism is really uh, of crucial importance. So uh, he denoted uh, this system as the system of relationism or relationalism, Guan Xi Zhuyi. He himself translated it with uh, Guan Xiism, but it is, uh, it is not such a nice translation. Okay, <clears throat> but the main problem, because it is very basic, is how they actually, uh, how they actually saw uh, the history of Confucianism. How they because this is this is this question is connected to um, to the interpretation of Confucianism as such. What does it mean to them? So um, they they said that um, that they all agree that the Chinese culture begins. In the period of the Yasmers, which Yasmers described as the axial age, and they all agree on the specific position or co and constellation of Chinese culture in this period. Period, maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, historical epoch or with this uh, cradle of the Chinese uh, civilization in the um, intellectual sense. That in this period, instead of a breakthrough. Transcendence in China, there was a breakthrough to humanity or to humanism, to a specific Chinese uh, kind of humanism. And uh, I will not go into reasons of this, uh, 
distinction because first of all it is well known and second of all uh, I don't have the time for it. And they also agreed that in this process early original Confucianism has played a decisive role. So, um, and they uh, divide this history of Confucianism in four phases and in three phases respectively. As we will see, Li Zihou and many Chinese intellectuals see this history as being divided into four phases. Why Li Zihou sees is uh, no, why modern Confucians see uh, on the three uh, phases or periods. So the first one is uh, original Confucianism, who emphasized, um, which emphasized uh, humaneness, rank and rituality, Li, of which we will uh, hear a lot today after my lecture. Uh, <clears throat> then the main representatives of original Confucianism were Confucius and his both his most important or most well-known followers. Mencius and uh, Shinzo. Uh, so maybe most of that of you are familiar with the main differences between Mengzi and Shinzo. Uh, the most uh, well-known one is their different uh, different um, view on what uh, many scholars call human nature, but I call the uh, uh, humanness. It is the it is that which separates human beings from animals and which in principle everybody is born with but which can be changed, that, that's why it's not human nature. But anyway, uh, <coughs> Shinza uh, believed that uh, this humanness is evil and bad and all human beings are essentially somehow egocentric, uh, while Mangza and Monks believe that uh, this humanness is good, and, um, <clears throat> but this is not the only uh, the only difference between them. In general, we can say that Schulze has developed further the more rational aspects of uh, the more rational aspects of original Confucianism, uh, while uh, and, and also he was a great um, logician. It's one of the greatest <coughs> um, scholars, ancient scholars, who <coughs> developed traditional Chinese logic. Xunzi has was more interested in ethics, and uh, he was somehow softer and more idealistic if we try to uh, apply a Western notion to them. So let's proceed to the second period. This this period happened in the. Uh, Han Dynasty, and it was very important uh, because uh, under the, 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 the main court ideologer, uh, Dong Zhongshu, has created in this phase uh, the Confucian state doctrine, which was very different from the original Confucianism. He created it by interpreting the Confu original Confucian teachings through the lens of Shunzi. And Shunzi, as I said, he was uh, more uh, a rigid follower of the Confucianism. And he is also uh, considered very often as a bridge between legalism and Confucianism. Now, are there people who, are there people who don't know about legalism? What is legalism? You are all familiar? Okay, so through this interpretation, Dong Zhong Shu, the creator of the new state doctrine, has succeeded to implement, to incorporate into the framework of what he called Confucianism, many elements of the legalist doctrine. That means that this second period was in the political sense uh, in the political sense, more rigid, more autocratic, and because it um, it also uh, included many legalist uh, elements, and also <coughs> this was um, 
the, this theory, this state doctrine was then later on furnished by, uh, I just have to look at the time, okay, yeah. it was furnished with, uh, with an institutional basis because they have implemented, uh, they have then established a system of, um, of official examinations which have provided to the successful candidates the, um, the possibility of achieving political and also financial uh, power. So, and, um, and the contents of this, <coughs> the contents of these uh, examinations were, of course, the Confucian classics. So, so Confucianism became the content of what everybody had to learn. And because it was a state doctrine, it was not expected from these candidates the, the exams to question, to critically question uh, Confucian ideas. They just were expected to learn them by heart, not to question them, and to incorporate the, these formal structures uh, in these uh, teachings. So what happened then was that most of the intellectuals were bored of the Confucianism. It, it didn't give them any intellectual satisfaction whatsoever anymore. So they, for their own pleasure, they started to uh, flirt with Buddhist and Taoist uh, philosophy, and these philosophies have, have given them a kind of intellectual satisfaction. So in Confucianism, they had to learn. And this is, of course, uh, very intimidating for every state doctrine, I think, because if nobody likes this state doctrine, then, <clears throat> yeah, um, then it is not a good, it is not a good sign for the state itself. So that's, that's why uh, a, a new reform of Confucianism became necessary, and this reform took place in the um, 13th century in the scope of the so-called <coughs> of the so-called Neo-Confucianism of the Song and Ming dynasties. Their main proponents, Zhu Xi and Wang Yangming, have successfully integrated many, uh, many elements of, of Taoist and Buddhist philosophy into the framework of Confucian philosophy. And in this uh, period, of course, that was a very latent and hidden process because on the surface, I mean, Buddhism and Taoism were the enemies. Juji has always severely criticized uh, Buddhism and Taoism, but at the same time, in a very latent way, he has uh, integrated many uh, elements of, uh, of Buddhist and Taoist philosophy and in this, what is also important, that in this period, in this reform, original Confucian teachings were not interpreted through Shunzi, but through Mencius, through Mencius, the softer guy who was also very emphasizing morality in this stuff. <coughs> okay, so this was the third period, and then the fourth period uh, is the period of the Confucian revival, which happened on the threshold of the 20th century. So um, we have, as we can see here, two streams. Confucianism, we have to know that Confucianism is not a monolithic building. There are many streams, and we can divide it in, in the history of Confucianism into two streams um, of thought. Uh, which interpreted, uh, interpreted original Confucianism in a very different way, the more rigid one, Wuliang and, no, uh, Gongyang uh, school and uh, somehow the softer one, um, Wuliang school. And these are two different interpretations of the Confucian work, Spring and Autumn, uh, and so, modern Confucians, 
uh, were the followers of the third period. Yeah? The period, the Neo-Confucian period, in which the Confucian teachings were, uh, were um, interpreted through the Mencian interpretations. So, therefore, they only distinguished three periods of, of Confucianism. The first one is original Confucianism, the second one is the Sungming Confucianism, and then the third one uh, is the Confucian revival of the 20th century to which they also belonged and they just neglected this uh, second phase that we can see. They just, there was no Dong Zhong Shu is not a real Confucian and this whole Confucianism of the second uh, phase didn't uh, uh, didn't emphasize morality uh, and th this is why um, why it is not important, this is not Confucianism for them. So they only distinguished these three phases and they ignored the second phase in which Confucianism was interpreted through Xunzi's interpretations. So these are the most uh, important, uh, we could say, differences between these two, uh, between these two discourses, and we could, of course, also uh, say if we would look at them through the Western lenses of philosophy, that uh, we could say that maybe. Uh, maybe uh, Mao Zongsan and the modern Confucian stream of thought could be denoted as idealist philosophers and Lizzo as a materialist but this is only a very rough orientation it, it, it is true to a certain extent but um, considering the fact that they were um, both these discourses still belong to modern Chinese philosophy. We cannot really talk uh, about them in terms of idealism or materialism because they are based on paradigms that are not dualistic. And uh, also, as, we, as you will uh, still see in following lectures in Litterhouse philosophy, these uh, discourses, this these spheres, these uh, paradigms were intertwined again okay, as a form of binary uh, categories. So, uh, but what really uh, maybe connects them is their uh, very strong emphasis of uh, Chinese tradition, Chinese history, because they're, they were very well acquainted with uh, the history of uh, Chinese philosophy, the history of Chinese thought, and it helped them uh, in a certain way, in their different ways, to interpret where China is today and also where it might go in future. And in this sense, they were um, they were both. Uh, leading us to uh, look back into the future, we could say. Okay, thank you very much.